let me introduce um, my colleague, uh, Major General Retired Mike Jones, who I had the, uh, the great, great uh, privilege to serve with, um, along with General Allen at United States Senate Board of Command, who serve as the moderator today. Uh, at this time, buddy, please, um, I'd like to introduce, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Paul Buca, um, recipient uh, of the Medal of Honor, and a distinguished member of the community to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you very much. When confronted with what to, how to introduce General Allen, uh, I looked at the resume and I said, no, we don't have time for this. <laughs> uh, and I also said, from what I know and remember, he doesn't have time for it either. <laughs> so I, I would like to just say that it's a very simple thing. When, you, when the students in the room are looking at what takes, makes a successful person, look at that resume. Study that resume. Listen and find those places where he was a teacher. You will, it's amazing to find that those who are successful are teachers in their high times and very, very successful at it. Then after it's over, think of what did those kids that he's been teaching learn? They learned to listen, and then they learned to speak respectfully. So when you look at that resume, pull that out and see. For me, the thrill of introducing General Allen is simple. I've taught leadership across this country, and this time, this time, I see leadership and wisdom for our times personified in our keynote speaker. General Allen, thank, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. thanks. It's gonna be a real treat today. For those of us uh, that have had the honor uh, of serving with General Allen. Uh, everyone knows about his great reputation as, as a Marine, uh, as a warrior, uh, and as a statesman. Uh, not everybody knows uh, about his, uh, uh, I guess, characteristics uh, of being a great listener, uh, a thoughtful person, uh, and a kind gentleman uh, who is always a pleasure to be around and work with and makes life better for those around him. So, uh, so sir, it's a real Thank honor to be you, Mike. here with you. Thank you. Uh, so I, I get the option to, uh, to ask some questions. Uh, and, uh, and the way we do this is I'll get to ask a few uh, really softball questions, sir. It'll be really easy. Uh, and then uh, the audience will get a chance to participate as well. And so if uh, it's like normal, uh, if you all will think of some uh, interesting questions that you might be interested in the, the general's response for. We'll have a segment of the program that does that as well. So, sir, let me, let me just start off. You know, we hear a lot about this phrase called America first. Uh, and a lot of people uh, sort of equate that uh, with uh, isolationism uh, in terms of how this uh, country operates in the world. Uh, so my question for you is, uh, is America first uh, at odds with the United States playing uh, a global leadership role uh, on the, in the world uh, stage? So. Um, Mike, thanks for the question. It's wonderful to see you. I don't know where Mike Mueller went, but it's good to see, well, it's wonderful to see him. We had a CENTCOM staff meeting just for <laughs> old sake uh, upstairs a little while ago. It was great. Uh, first, uh, buddy, it's wonderful to be back. Uh, in your presence and to be at the World Affairs Council, to be at Goodman College. I see many good friends uh, in the audience I've known for many years, many years in some cases. Uh, my escort today is a Sergeant First Class Chairman. Uh, I've always been at my best when an NCO was in charge, <laughs> so I want to thank you for that. It's always great to be in the presence of a great soldier. And I want to make one quick comment. Eight and a half hours uh, to our east, uh, the people of Afghanistan today went to the polls to exercise their right to vote, a right the Taliban would never have given them, a right the Taliban may take away from them in the future. And on the front row, we have two officials from the Afghan embassy, both ladies. The Afghan ambassador to the United States is a lady. 
these are fundamental changes in that country that we have to acknowledge. And as we think about where we're going with peace in Afghanistan, the first thing that comes to mind for me, knowing the Taliban as I do, is what will become of the women of Afghanistan if we don't do this right. Uh, Mike, your question is, I think, uh, central to many of the issues that we face today in the world. We, we hear America first. Uh, we hear make America greater, great again. L let's just talk about some reality here. The, the United States in the aftermath of World War II and in the aftermath of the Cold War has been more consequential to the state of world affairs than any other country uh, in the context of the enormity of its effect, the extent of its reach, the long-term outcome of its influence than any other country in the history of the world. And there have been great empires. But one of the first things I want to say about what has made this country what it is, is if you go back, and it's worth reading, the speech by a great leader who visited the United States and spoke, and sometimes great leaders from outside our country get, hold the mirror up to us to see ourselves. A fellow by the name of Lee Kuan Yew, who put Singapore on the map and would carefully lead the evolution of Singapore. And he spoke before a joint session of Congress. And he said, in the entire history of the world, uh, no entity has gained this much power and did not use it for ill. No country in the world has had this much capacity and did not become rapacious, did not subjugate whole populations, did not create colonial empires, but instead, as a nation, as a people, in the context of an idea, we were willing to subordinate sometimes those which might be our best national interests to the greater good of world affairs and humankind. That's unique in history. So I, I, I worry sometimes about the ideology that gets appended onto things like America first or make America great again. Because in the end, the United States has been in the aftermath of World War II, one of the most consequential influences in the history of humankind. My concern about this is that as we think about in very narrow terms what it means, what these terms mean, is that we are beginning to withdraw in the global context in ways that have been so instrumental to the stability that the United States invented, the integration that the United States fostered, and the stability that the United States preserved in the aftermath of World War II. And I think we all recognize, look at these flags around the room. We recognize that the strength of the United States has never been measured in the numbers of soldiers. That is a powerful measure. The strength of the United States has been measured in our capacity for influence. So our economy, for one thing, our capitalist economy, is the most powerful force on the planet, shy of, obviously, nuclear weapons. But in the bigger context of things, it is still an enormous force for good. I've been thanked, Mike's been thanked, Mike's been thanked, many of you who've been in uniform have been thanked crossing through a, an airport in uniform on the way to Iraq or the way to Afghanistan or the way to Syria, wherever it might be, by Americans who genuinely appreciate service. But a group that almost never gets thanked are our diplomats and those who work at the edge of American influence, sometimes in enormous danger. And they are the ones who have created the outer edge of American influence. Our diplomacy, not 10 carrier strike groups, not 12 army divisions, not X number of Air Force fighter groups. That is, of course, the coercive dimension of our diplomacy that gives us the capacity to extend our influence. But when America first means withdrawing from this international community within which we were really the authors, about which we were the authors, when it means uh, 
putting less emphasis on multilateralism as a way to solve the world's greatest problems. Uh, when it no longer commits the United States to one of the things that most, Im that most important characteristic of our country, which is our commitment to human rights, the rights of women, the rights of minority, the rule of law, free speech, a free and independent press. When it appears that we are moving away from those values, then America first does mean America last. Because much of the rest of the world, much of the rest of the world that is free and at peace and economically viable today is so because we were connected and because we stood for something and because by God we were willing to fight for it and to shed our blood on their behalf in order to preserve that international order. There's nothing wrong with the United States looking out for its national interests. But one of the greatest things about American national interests was those interests were mappable immediately on the greater global interests that kept the world peace at peace and so for so much of the world uh, provided for the opportunity of economic prosperity. Great, thanks, sir. Uh, sir, we talked about, you've mentioned American leadership. Um, how do you view America's role as a global leader and is there a difference between or a distinction between uh, American leadership and the concept of United States leadership? Um, well, the U United States and, and the last panel was really spectacular, actually. They touched an awful lot of what, what I think we could talk about, too, as well. The United States has always had two things really going for it. Uh, this idea of global leadership. Uh, Farah used the term global convening power. And here's an example. Uh, those of us in the room who were involved in fighting the Islamic State, when that horrendous entity began to explode onto the scene and they were crucifying Christian children and beheading Shia prisoners that they were taking in the most horrible way. The President of the United States called for a global coalition to counter the Islamic State. He didn't go to the UN because he knew there would probably be some difficulties with the permanent members. He didn't go to NATO because NATO is about defending Europe. He called for a global coalition. Now, I ended up <clears throat> as his special presidential envoy to the Global Coalition, and the 65 nations that ran to the call of the United States was a convening of the largest coalition to go to war against an institution in the history of the world. And it was the, the idea was to stop this horrific entity. So when the President of the United States called for a global response, our allies and our partners and our friends, they responded. That's the capacity of the United States for global convening, and that's global leadership. And then there is the other of the two characteristics, which is global reach. The economy of the United States, as I've said already, is one of the most pervasive influences on the planet. Our, our financial sector really dictates banking, the banking policies of the world. Uh, our industrial sector, while it has diminished or has converted in certain ways, is still enormously influential. <clears throat> so the, the United States global reach, which is everything from uh, our soft power through Hollywood, through the presence of American industry around the world, uh, to the other end, which is precision strike overnight, what Mike, Mike used to tell me, if it absolutely, positively has to be destroyed overnight, call the United States Air Force. <laughs> and he was probably at the stick. <laughs> so global leadership and convening power and global reach, and global reach in the most positive sense. That has been traditionally what the United States represented and what American power represented. We, we have begun to see, I think, a bit of a schism uh, emerging here. Uh, you know, we walked away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was a, com a community of 12 states, us, and 11 other Asian partners that would have created a, <clears throat> an economic um, capacity to confront China in an economic way. Uh, we walked away from the Paris Climate Accord. We walked away from 
the JCPOA, which is the effort to constrain the Iranian nuclear capabilities. And, and Mike and I actually know a lot about that, which is why I was always a supporter of it. We walked away from the INF Treaty. We may not start New START. That's also, that's, that's traditional U.S. leadership. And as we see that receding, we're leaving uncovered key segments of our influence. We walked away from the Human Rights Council on the UN and left it to countries for whom human rights is, is, is no priority whatsoever. And frankly, our Chinese friends in the Human Rights Council have attempted to redefine human rights in a manner that fits their definition. And the absence of the United States in that council opens the playing field to those kinds of differing opinions and definitions of human rights. We walked away from UNRWA, which is the organization that we have been providing hundreds of millions of dollars to over the years for the Palestinians to try to coerce them to the table to deal in Middle East peace. I was in the Middle East peace process. I know how that, that works. And in walking away from UNRWA, that defunded many of the Palestinian schools that produced the very Palestinians who could come to the table to negotiate. And the world had to close down on that. So as U.S. leadership seems to be trending in a certain way, American leadership is really stepping up to the plate. Let me just tell you, the people in this room are American leaders. The young cadets and the young students in this room are future American leaders. And by God, you've got to start thinking in those terms. It can't be only about the United States government, as Farah and others said. It has to be about Americans standing for something, embracing values that, um, that the world needs for us to embrace, and then prepared to lead, be prepared to lead from the front. At great cost sometimes. At great cost. Um, so, we walked away from the Paris Climate Accord. Look at the numbers of states and cities and localities and NGOs that have embraced all of the standards of the Paris Climate Accord, and we're going to do it anyway. And people have asked me, Mike, what is the greatest threat that faces the United States today? What keeps me up at night? There's a whole bunch of things that keep me up at night, actually. <laughs> um, uh, but the one that I, gets a little of my sleep every night is the inevitability of the negative effects of climate change. Yes! That is a great Stetson. I'm going to be the second guy to comment on that from the floor here. Um, the inevitability of it. Here was an opportunity for the United States once again to lead the global community in dealing with the greatest threat we will all face. And we walked away from the Paris Climate Accord. That's a sliver of the demonstration of U.S. leadership as compared to California and Ohio and cities embracing it and becoming partners with uh, allies overseas. The Sustainable Development Goals. Anybody here ever heard of those? The SDGs. SDGs are the 17 areas from women's equality to educating the people of the developing world to enduring energy supplies, to ma maximizing and leveraging cities, 17 different goals. The entire United Nations adhered to it, the United States did, and we failed to show up to report on our progress this year when everybody else did. Yet, there were three major convenings on the SDG in New York, where I was in Dunga all week, that were led by the United States. Sorry, were led by Americans on behalf of the concepts of the SDGs. So Mike, the world still usually asks as one of the first questions uh, when there's a hard issue before them. Uh, our friends ask, what would the United States want us to do? And our enemies will say, what can we now get away with? And that's something we should be very attentive to as time continues to go on. Yeah, thanks, sir. The, uh, interestingly, you mentioned uh, our role uh, in the post-World War II era of shaping uh, what was uh, a kind of a new evolution of the global order. 
and, and, and it's exemplified by things like the United Nations Charter and right. the Geneva Conventions 1947 and so forth. So a lot of the rules uh, that we established after the horrific experience of the Second World War in order to try to preserve the peace uh, were shaped, in fact, by us. Uh, and, and to some degree have, have certainly been successful over 75 years of preventing major power conflict. Uh, do you see uh, that global order becoming less orderly, that chips uh, being taken out of that global order that's been successful for uh, really more than seven decades? Yeah, I would, I would say yes. It's not just a function of of uh, often people just point to this administration and say it's this president and this administration. It has been eroding for some time. Because in many respects, it's, it was an, an unnatural order. Much of the world was sort of on its own before the United States exploded onto the world scene. We came out of World War I, we were a very reluctant power. Woodrow Wilson had the points that would have uh, created the League of Nations, and had the United States stayed in the League of Nations, it might have been able to prevent uh, World War II. I don't know. His historians may have different views. But the period of time after World War II, where the United States as a superpower, with the enormity of its economy and its organizing capacity, it did several things. It sought to integrate the community of nations so that they were, in many respects, reliant upon each other. It sought to create economic, an economic environment where the world could achieve prosperity. It was unequal, and much of the world was flat on its back and had been for many centuries, and, but flat on its back, their economies were ruined. The Marshall Plan, for example, was intended not just to help the European states off their back at the end of World War II, and allies and uh, opponents were up flat on their back. The, the intent of the Marshall Plan was to integrate Europe in a very important way to prevent through economic integration the unwillingness of the emerging democracies ultimately to fight each other. So there was, there was a stabilization through multilateralism. There was a stabilization and an integration through economic integration. The whole Bretton Woods process that created such things as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and the global financial system that still is so powerful because of Wall Street and, and New York. But one of the things that the United States led on, which none of the powers that are emerging today can lead on, is the issue of human rights. On our absolute commitment to the human rights of the people in the world. And we have failed sometimes to live up to our own standards. But I would say everyone in this room, if I said to you, what does the United States stand for? List five things. Somewhere in those top five would be that we stand for values, and those values are a commitment to human rights, as I said a moment ago, and the rights of women and minorities and freedom of speech and freedom of press. So we led in the context of human rights. We led in the context of economic power. We led in the context of championing multilateralism. And as other powers have emerged, they have taken aim at those multilateral organizations. They've taken aim at American leadership. And as American leadership puts its emphasis elsewhere, and I want to make, be very clear, I hear a lot from people that the United States is in decline. The United States is not in decline. We are an enormously powerful people. We are an enormously powerful country. But our priorities have become reordered in many respects, and that's created white space for those with other ambitions and those with other value sets to find purchase, and to find agency. And one of the things we spend a lot of time on at Brookings right now, and it's one of my three presidential research priorities, is American leadership in the 21st century. And I use the word American leadership specifically. In the 21st century, we have to figure out what our relationship will be with the Chinese, which is fraught, how, what our relationship will be with India, which has enormous potential, yet I think it remains to be fully exploited. Mm -hmm. um, what our relationship will be, how it will preserve the transatlantic relationship, 
And there's 500 million people on this planet and some of the most productive economies in the world. And when we come together as a transatlantic relationship, there's no other block of nations on the planet that stands more openly and clearly for human rights and capitalism, capitalism in the, pro in the positive sense, and then military power if necessary through NATO. We're gonna have to deal with Russia. And I'm always careful about proclaiming China a threat, lots of people like to. I, I would like to have that conversation if you're interested, but Russia is a threat to the United States. It's a thermonuclear threat. It's a cultural threat. Uh, they attempted to interfere with our election. Uh, there are some would say, well, we just, we do the same all the time. That's not, we, we have, that's not the same as what they're doing to us today. Uh, so we gotta deal with Russia. I think we can. And then I think we have to deal with a couple of realities that are coming at us uh, in terms of American leadership again. I've already touched on climate. Um, climate is the existential threat that we're facing and the planet will still be livable. But the, there will be elements in this planet, on this planet, and I think we're already passing 1.5 degrees Celsius. We're liable to go straight past that at two. And here's the key. We're gonna create a climate environment where while the economic impact of that will be measured in the trillions of dollars and potentially even begin to exceed the gl total global GDP, the reality will be that large segments of Africa will be unlivable. The speed of desertification, the inability for them to cultivate crops. Uh, remember what just two million conflict migrants, refugees, did to European politics in 2015. You have three kinds of refugees. You have conflict refugees, you have economic refugees, and now emerging in significant and disturbing numbers are climate refugees. We will be lucky if by the end of this century not a, there aren't fewer than 100 million climate refugees, with one quarter of the world's population in Africa by the middle of this century, and rapid desertification and elements of, that pop of, of the climate there becoming unlivable. If we don't think about this in, those co in that context, look at the deep horizon, which is only the United States can lead that conversation. We've got real challenges, economic challenges, human challenges, and if we don't think that the United States military is going to ultimately have to deploy to defend our friends or to deal with resource wars, then we really need to think about uh, our priorities. So here is the uniqueness of this country. Here is this moment of global leadership that's desperately needed on the, for the planet. And the question becomes, are we up to it now? And I have great concerns about that. Sir, I want to thank you for bringing up climate change. Uh, you know, just as an example, one of, one of the things I like to do is some diving, and one of my favorite places is Cozumel, uh, Mexico. Uh, it's been all, always one of the great dive destinations. I just got a note uh, night before last that uh, Mexico is closing down uh, access to the reef off the coast of Cozumel um, because as a result of combination of pollution and the changing water temperature, about 50% of the reef is now dead. Uh, and, and they don't know if they're gonna be able to prevent 100% of that reef being dead. But that's, that's how significant uh, some of these changes that no one necessarily hears about much, right. but are happening in spots all around the world. So thank you for, for bringing okay. that up. Let me just add one quick point here. Uh, Brookings is spending a lot of time on this now. Uh, while the uh, rainforests have always been considered in many respects, you, you've heard the euphemism these days, it's the lungs of the world because of carbon absorption and, and oxygen production. If, that, if those are the lungs of the world, the oceans have been the temperature absorbent factor on the planet and have absorbed now basically all the temperature that it can. And historically, it's been about 30 degrees. It's amazing how much the oceans have absorbed temperature. The oceans can't anymore, and they're getting warmer. And that warmth translates into energy, into, into weather patterns. And as meteorologists and atmospheric science, scientists begin to talk about category six hurricanes 
category five becoming routine, category six becoming the next uh, classification. With sea level rising, the capacity to move large amounts of seawater kilometers inland uh, with storm surge. So you have the power of the storm with more water going up into the atmosphere, the amount of deluge that occurs, and then the driving by the power of the storm of sea uh, seawater deep into our interior in the past. Large segments of the coast will become uncultivatable at some point. And people will move off the coast because you can't get insurance anymore. The insurance industry will be devastated over this. And this is now, here's a social problem because those who can move will move. And that segment of our population that can't move, the disadvantaged segments of our population, uh, disproportionately the populations of color, who can't move will be subjected to this over and over and over again. So we talk about a trillion dollar infrastructure bill. Let's look into that bill. First of all, let's see how much, carb how much more carbon will be put into the atmosphere with a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure development. And when we're done building the infrastructure, will that infrastructure in fact help us to manage and mitigate climate? Because we can't stop it now, can't stop it now. Will it help us to mitigate and manage the effects of climate? Uh, or are we just going to continue in the same uh, venue of thinking uh, as we have in the past? All of this, Mike, all of this is about leadership. And when the leadership is ready to make the hard decisions about whether you're going to be voted out of office or not, I won't go through the politics with you. Brookings did a major study across the country on the effects of climate change, county by county using big data analytics. And in the west where we're burning up, in the center of the country where enraged weather patterns are ravaging our communities, dumping huge amounts of water onto those communities, flooding, and in the east where hurricanes are having the effect that they are. <clears throat> you want to take a second to go look at that um, study? We are voting for and putting into our legislature and into our executive individuals who have no commitment to climate or climate change. I'm not talking about the parties. You can, you can decide for yourselves about the parties. But the problem is we are not taking the steps necessary to put leaders in place that are willing to embrace, I believe, one of the greatest challenges that the United States faces in the 21st century. Yeah. I'll stop there. Great, sir. Thank, thanks so much for that. Um, uh, another area I know that you're interested in. Uh, I, I know you're interested in this. I know Brookings is doing work in this, and, and Dave Sanger mentioned it this morning, and that is uh, artificial intelligence sure. and the impact uh, in, in how we think about that impact on national security. Uh, and global security and the U.S.'s role uh, in terms of leadership in that domain. Could you talk to us about that? Sure. It, I have, uh, this is good news, I think, in many, in many respects. I'm sorry? Semper Fi. Semper Fi. <laughs> Oorah. Uh, this is joint audience, so I'll, jay, I'll say Jay Hua. <laughs> um, I think artificial intelligence is going to change. Uh, it, it will be one of the most influential uh, properties that we'll see uh, in the 21st century. It will be of enormous value to us in the issue of climate, in being through big data analytics and the supercomputing which is necessary and the access to data we've never had before to help us to understand uh, what the spread and what the most at-risk areas are on the planet and how we can help at-risk communities with the right kinds of crop, et cetera, right types, types of uh, agriculture and cultivation. Uh, the capacity for big data analytics and artificial intelligence to help with diagnoses of diseases uh, that we could, it would have taken years to begin the process of the diagnosis. And then the process of treatment, if it's a pharmacological outcome, again, the capacity for big data analytics in sometimes completely automated testing and pharmacological processes, the, the pharmacy of it, completely automated to produce the drug at the last moment for the, for the human testing can speed this along in ways we can't even begin to imagine. So uh, rapid diagnosis, rice, rapid pharmacologic, uh, pharmacological uh, outcomes. So 
our human condition will be different. We'll have auto, autonomous vehicles, autonomous delivery. Uh, I would predict that if we were sitting here in 2030, which is a very long panel, uh, <laughs> you will go out of this building in 2030 and look up and there will be autonomous systems flying in preordained lanes controlled by artificial intelligence that will be delivering much of what you see today that is roadbound. They'll be electric, so they won't be producing carbon, but AI gives us the capacity to do that sort of thing. AI will fundamentally change what happens in the classroom. The classroom will cease to be an environment of teaching and, and be far more a system, an environment of learning. And the learning environment and the curriculum, because we know so much more about the students themselves, will be personally tailored in ways that will be unique to that child and ultimately will have immediate feedback. I think AI, supercomputing, big data analytics, con connected to, but seldom mentioned, biotechnology will change everything. I have, I, in fact, I fly back today for the birthdays of my two grandsons. Uh, I have every reason to believe both of them will live to be 100 years old. And they'll be healthy when they get there because of the change, profound change, that will come from all of this. So I think our world will be much better. Um, again, with leadership. Uh, the, the first moderator talked about difficulties in establishing norms. This is the big challenge that we have today. The norms that govern how we develop algorithms are a challenge. For example, one of the work streams at Brookings is artificial intelligence and bias. Because we're really only at the beginning of this, much of the big data databases within which we work are, is data that was biased towards people that look like me. Uh, so people, they are, there is bias for gender and there's bias, bias for people of color. Uh, we have to understand that going in. And while AI can deliver through big data analytics potentially biased outcomes, I also now believe, since we know this, and we can work on the scrubbing of the big databases that we work from, AI can also have an enormously important role in eliminating bias in our society. Um, and then governance. We have to have a common vision on the role that artificial intelligence will play in our societies. We talk about autonomous vehicles. Uh, the, one of the only reasons that we don't see much more autonomous activity up and down our interstates is because uh, we haven't developed the policy protocols that permits us to have a nationwide protocol on all of this. So we have municipal approaches, we have state approaches, we have federal approaches. So we, we've got to have the policy process catch up with the technology. So AI offers enormous uh, capabilities for good for humankind and I'm, I'm very excited about it and uh, we want to be part of helping to understand that. Uh, but AI has a real potential for harm as well. Uh, there's a theory of uh, warfare that we've begun to do a good bit of writing on at uh, Brookings called hyperwar. Uh, hyperwar talks about the capacity through supercomputing, automated systems, and autonomous decision making to accelerate warfare to a speed that we've heretofore never even contemplated. And I, I know there are commanders out here who have, <clears throat> who have lived in the world where you have to make a hard decision. And David talked about cyber a lot this morning. We've talked about cyber a lot this morning. And the, the cyber domain is, is its own unique domain. And it will be instrumental, sometimes even decisive, in warfare in the future. But there are still physical aspects of the, of the physical domain we have to deal with in your service as an armor officer, as, as Mike's, in Mike's service as a fighter pilot, there were, in the context of officers making decisions, there were physical limitations on how quickly you could do something by, because of the material dimension of it. But often the amount of time that it took to have a physical outcome was determined by the capacity to create the, the ability for commanders to decide. And now, we, now what we see is uh, automated intelligence collection, automated intelligence analysis that can provide information far more quickly 
uh, to commanders for their decisions. And if we find ourselves at some point in the future, we can talk about this if you like, where we have, as, a, as humans, if we have uh, permitted autonomous decision making to occur in the aftermath of intelligence collection for the purposes of then committing autonomous systems into combat roles, the whole speed of this has picked up at a, at a rate we can't even begin to imagine. Now, happily for us, we're governed as a people, and our friends are, are similar, transatlantic alliance, certainly. Um, we're all governed by principles that, that see that while warfare may sometimes be necessary, controlling the violence of warfare and seeking to retain our humanity while we must fight is important to us. It's who we are as a people. So we're coming to grips with, and next week I'm back in New York to talk about this, uh, about the reality of something called laws which are lethal autonomous weapon systems. Now the worst thing that could ever have happened to us was the, the uh, not the Predator movies, what? Terminator. Thank you, the Terminator movies, thank you over there. Oh yeah, 20. Um, <laughs> because there are gonna be killer robots out there. But the question for us is as a, as a hu humane society, how do we deal with that? Now there are the Geneva Convention, the law of armed conflict, all of those, there are protocols out there that actually do provide us everything we need now to deal with this. The question is how do we come to grips with it in the, in the areas of warfare? Now, let me just tell you what I do know, because I don't know where this will end up. I, I've got a pretty good feel for it. What I do know is our adversaries are not in the least constrained on lethal autonomous weapon systems. It's entirely possible that two fishing dows just off the coast of Dubai could launch 10 or 20 quadcopters with a quarter pound stick of C4 using computer vision and artificially intelligent to fly, imagine, people here have been in Dubai, you know how complicated this, the city is, <clears throat> 20 quadcopters all pre-targeted with computer vision to fly exactly where they need to, impacting in various locations around that city, imagine Imagine the crisis that would occur, or a concerted attack like that on something, some other dimension of the oil industry in the Middle East. The fact that we have not yet had a quadcopter attack on a major U.S. sporting event, to me, is remarkable at this point. So artificial intelligence, while it has enormous, just as any invention, has enormous capacity to do good, there are real implications here that we have to consider. And I, I make, I'll make this point, <clears throat> that throughout history, there has been a relationship between the nature of war, cadets, you ought to be listening to this, the nature of war, which is the human capacity to be involved in conflict, and the character of war, which is the technical, technological capacity that supports conflict. <clears throat> when those two are in an equilibrium, then generally we can find our way through the the challenges of innovation. But when they get out, of, get out of equilibrium, in other words, when the speed of technology surpasses ultimately the human capacity to understand the lethality or the destructiveness, you may not even fully grasp it until you're actually in combat where many mysteries are revealed. <clears throat> when they get out of uh, equilibrium, then things like Pearl Harbor occur. Things like the Blitzkrieg occur. Things like devastating cyber attacks occur because the capacity has far exceeded our capacity both to understand it, to create the norms that govern it, and the ability to react to it. What I worry about now is that we are way behind in our human capacity to understand the full potential of supercomputing artificial intelligence and what autonomy can bring to conflict, which we, we stipulate is something called hyperwar. Sorry, sorry, I keep going for a long time, but I promised the audience that we'd have an opportunity for some questions, so, uh, so let me create that opportunity. But, all right, let's uh, start with this uh, young lady back here who was very quick to the draw with her hand, I, I have to say. Hi, um, my name is Sophia Chin. I'm a senior at South Windsor High School. Um, I was just wondering 
How do you think that all of those priorities that you talked about, like human rights, climate change, and those global threats, how can they have Americans, how can we have Americans making change as global leaders with all like the increased polarization that we're experiencing right now, like so much gridlock? Well, the good news, this is, this is why I said a moment ago, these are American leaders in here. That's an American leader. <clears throat> the good news is we live in a democratic system, a system which can ultimately hold those accountable uh, who fail to lead. And we do have gridlock right now, but uh, you know, there's a very interesting thing that's happened in the last couple of days. If this impeachment process moves forward, and I'm not gonna take a position on it here, if it moves forward, there will be no question in the minds of the American people where everyone stood when it came time to vote. And so we're gonna know who's ready to lead, and who's ready to hold people accountable, and who's ready to do this or that. We are in gridlock right now, and that gridlock is not just about this administration. This gridlock right now is a long period of time uh, of economic uh, challenge that large segments of the American population have been suffering under for a long period of time. We talk about how powerful our economy is. There are huge segments of our economy that has had virtually, of, of our population has had virtually no pay increase in 20 years. Now, let's be careful about being fooled by the reality that 3.8 percent employment means that our economy is in fact fulfilling the needs of all of American people, and they, they, it isn't, and they aren't. Uh, so much of what has generated so many of the tensions and has generated much of the politics now has been a long-serving uh, or long-building process. But until people are willing uh, for them to be defeated in the polls because they actually stand for what's right instead of for the next election, uh, then we're going to have a challenge in this country. One of the things that's happening right now that we have, we're just beginning to see, which I think is enormously powerful, is go look, and there are graphics out there, go look at the graphics that reflected everyone that was elected in the 2018 election. In ways we have not seen before, and I think in ways that we will now see every time since, every time from now on, there are more people of color that have been elected. There are more People, there are more women that have been elected. There are younger candidates that have been elected and more veterans. And this is the future of the United States. And they're all mad as hell, frankly, because of either how their identity, as Farah talked about, how their identity has been treated, or how their families have been treated, or how they've had to struggle within their neighborhoods for some modicum of economic uh, prosperity. And we're going to see people start to burn through the polarization, I think, of the politics and start to stand for good policy and not dogmatic politics. Now, <laughs> that, that's an independent voter. Uh, <laughs> look, we're a democracy, and democracies are sometimes slow to change. But democracies can change, and when the momentum begins to build, there is nothing more powerful on the planet than a democracy that is seized with a good cause. And so I think that uh, your question is important. Uh, it's gonna take leadership, and it's gonna take individuals willing to be both selfless and to sacrifice, and to potentially sacrifice a political career to do the right thing. Great. Thank you, great, great question. Um, uh, back over here on the left-hand side here. When you're talking about going into warfare that's uh, relying on um, more the AI and or even self-driving automobiles, I think a big thing that would me addressing to ask you is what would they do as far as even though there's laws in place, uh, for instance, if it gets hacked, who takes responsibility uh, during the decisions? Because now we're not looking at human error, we're looking at um, mechanical or other errors, uh, let AI. Um, who takes responsibilities if something goes wrong or something gets hacked or something even gets turned against us that was meant for something else? Uh, we don't have the, the body of, of legislation and policy necessary for us uh, to ensure that uh, A, when we put an autonomous vehicle on the road, uh, it is sufficiently self-contained in the context of its uh, driving, its autonomous driving capability that it can't be hacked. Uh, and I, I will simply tell you that th there are 
entities out there that are looking for every possible way to penetrate a vehicle's navigation capabilities to take possession of it, to turn it into a weapon. So that is a consideration that we have to uh, undertake. And, and the technology right now for you to walk outside and have one, the right-hand lane of every superhighway in this country be occupied solely by autonomous uh, trucking, that technology exists today. That's not really what's holding it up. What's holding it up is the absence of policy and norms that you're talking about in order to, to provide the American people the confidence that they deserve for that system to operate properly. Now, you know, we put a two and a half ton vehicle in the hands of 16 year olds all the time, and that should scare us all to death. <laughs> There's very little policy around that. Um, I, I actually think that when we get this right, and the technology continues to get better and better, when we get this right, we will see the, the carnage on the American highways drop really dramatically uh, every year. In terms of weapon systems, that's one of the hard questions that we have. And, and frankly, and I've had this conversation uh, a number of times, you can firewall that part of the battle, let's just say it's a battle, you can firewall that part of the battle <clears throat> where an autonomous system actually, Mike would know this term, pickles the weapon system off the wing. And that, that is still a human activity. But here's an example of where AI can be enormously efficient. Aircraft on a mission, it uh, encounters a difficulty at some point. The AI sensors on that aircraft uh, uh, detect and acknowledge the anomaly in that dynamic system so early <clears throat> that it can either shift uh, to alternative systems within the avionics, or as the aircraft is coming back in, it will project back to the ground not just what the problem is, because of something called natural language processing, which is now the capacity for us to ingest every written word ever in any manual for the maintenance of that aircraft, when the ground crew comes out to service that vehicle, to, uh, that weapon, to turn it around and get the airplane back in the air, rearm it and get it back up, they'll show up with the iPad with exactly what needs to be done to that aircraft because the, the aircraft self-diagnosed itself and sent everything to the ground. Now that's a sustainability and maintenance capability that AI can make enormous strides in that doesn't require us to kill anybody. So I, I think that there is now, let's talk about the lethal part of it. In the law of armed conflict, commanders must fulfill three provisions in the bottom line, bottom line, three provisions in order to take life or inflict infrastructural damage. The first is, it's called necessity. So a commander has decided that force is necessary. The second is, it's called distinguishment or discrimination. The capacity to distinguish between uh, a combatant and a non-combatant. And then the third is proportionality. Uh, the commander is responsible, no matter what, for fulfilling all three of those things in order for uh, the employment of force. We don't yet have the confidence in uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems that the system has the capacity for distinction Distinct discrimination to distinguish uh, the combatants from non-combatants, and we, we still have very serious reservations about whether the system can decide on disproportionate use of force as opposed to the proportionate use. And the law says use the minimal amount of force necessary to accomplish the mission. That's what makes us humane. That's why we don't bomb hospitals. That's why we don't uh, attack uh, doctors and physicians. All of that's an algorithm, and all of that's code, and all of that has to be developed to a high level, and, and in here somewhere, in the context of that autonomous system has target identification, what we call PID, positive target identification, maybe through facial recognition, maybe through intersecting uh, geospatial uh, locators. Target identification, you're prepared for target engagement, which is the pickling of the system. The question for us becomes, where is the human in this process? Will we ever permit the system 
to, it, to find the target, identify the target, and engage the target without a human in the loop. And as a human in the loop, which stops the process, makes the decision, and permits the system to be, the weapon to be employed, or as a human on the loop, watching it happen and doesn't intervene at all if the individual is confident uh, that the system will engage the right target and proportionality will be achieved. It's a tough conversation that we're having. And you know, we're having this conversation because of who we are as a people. Uh, so I don't know what the answer will be on that. I don't know how long this will take us. But for now, uh, and Mike and I and, and Mike, we lived with, and I, as the commander in Afghanistan, I lived with it every day. Uh, we, we had drone operating operations over the battle space all the time. But no system, no Hellfire missile ever came off any of the rails on any of our systems without positive identification and the three uh, steps that I've talked about being achieved in LOAC. So I'm sorry for the long answer, but what I want you to understand is this is a complicated issue. There is no clean answer to this, but you should be happy that we haven't come to a quick conclusion and we're arming autonomous systems right now in ways that can take life without uh, a human governed by those three principles in the loop somewhere. Do you believe that NATO will continue to be a viable institution in the future? Uh, there still remains a conventional threat uh, to uh, the eastern frontier of, uh, of NATO. I spend a good bit of time in the central European states. They're under a, an enormous amount of pressure from the Russians constantly. Uh, there has been a drift of, of illiberalism uh, in uh, several of our eastern European or central European states. And of course, NATO is not an offensive organization. NATO is not against anyone, but NATO is for the defense of Europe. And as NATO has continued to evolve, part of that evolution is a cyber defense capabilities. Uh, and, and in that context, NATO increasingly has to uh, have a closer relationship with the European Union so that NATO and the European Union can have a common policy on the cyber defense of the individual states within the Union and more broadly in NATO plus a, an increased counterterrorism capability. So I think as NATO has continued to evolve, there, there must still be both a, con, a conventional deterrent that NATO must have. You know, we've seen Crimea separated from uh, Ukraine. We've seen the Donbass has been an active conflict in southeastern Ukraine now for several years. Uh, we have seen the largest Russian uh, military operations on the uh, eastern frontier of NATO in many years, and there's still a huge Russian enclave in the uh, Baltic states. Uh, so there has to be a, uh, a deterrence. That deterrence still must have a, a vertical deterrence to it, a nuclear deterrence as well as a conventional deterrence. The decision making has to be capable. But look, in the end, whether NATO ever fires a shot or not, NATO is an accumulation of 29 nations, perhaps 30 here in the not too distant future, that's, that stands once again for values. The values that uh, we all espouse to being so important to our societies. It's the most successful alliance in history. And it's slow. Uh, we always worry about whether it can fight tonight. We're complaining about whether people are paying the 2% investment into the overall structure. Um, but I sure as, sure as heck would want to have NATO around uh, if something happened on the eastern flank. And one of the other doctrine that NATO is, is embracing, and I don't think it's doing enough of it, is where we used to project power, that term project power, NATO talks now about projecting stability. And as we see changes a thousand kilometers south of Europe in climate creating greater instability, or as uh, jihadist terrorism continues to gain momentum, Boko Haram, uh, Ansar al-Sharia, Ansar al-Bet al-Maktis, uh, al-Shabaab, all of those are still very virulent organizations that can destabilize fragile states. One of the great values that NATO can have is to project stability a thousand kilometers rather than projecting force and helping those countries to understand how to create stable security environments within which then economic development can occur and stabilized representative government can evolve. So long, long answer to a short question. I think NATO is very relevant 
if for no other reason, because it is the alliance that will defend the democracies and our values if push ever comes to shove. Okay. Important question, thanks very much. How about this cadet right here? Uh, go, go ahead and stand up and get a mic to him. Sir, do you believe that democracy and AI can coexist, or will the existence and implementation of AI demand us to redefine what democracy is? Because if you have an algorithm that knows yourself better than you consciously think and can make decisions for you, and if you have ad campaigns that actively know your preferences and can manip manipulate you, is democracy really legitimate anymore? Thank you. Don't sit down. <laughs> what are you majoring in? International Affairs in Chinese, sir. Excellent. Very good. What are you, what are you going to branch? I'm hoping um, a branch detail of infantry to military intelligence, sir. All right. You know two things that's really important, so well done. Thank Good question. <clears throat> this is, now you can sit down. <laughs> and, and sit down quickly. <laughs> um, that's a great question because the whole issue of what we call digital authoritarianism is on the rise. And we really worry about that. Uh, one of the greatness, great dimensions of who we are as a people is that our society is wide open in many respects. Uh, that gives us the capacity for uh, interaction in ways we can't, could not have imagined, uh, uh, commerce, economic development, uh, freedom, freedom of movement, uh, both vertically in the, in the social context, freedom of movement in the linear context across the country. People could live anywhere they want to. Uh, we're an open society, we're a democracy, and that has made us, so many ways, the consequential power on the planet. Um, but it also has made us very vulnerable. And this is, once again, where the absence of norms and the kinds of laws necessary to control trolls and to control the bots uh, and to hold uh, either groups, people, or entities accountable for intentionally micro-targeting uh, through influence operations, elements of the population, hold them accountable for that. This is who we are. We're a nation of laws, and holding people according to the rule of law is part of what we have to do. Uh, I think we may have to ultimately uh, look closely at how information flows uh, it within a democracy, and I'm not pr pr proposing that we preclude that or limit the flow of, of information, but I think we're going to start to hold people more accountable for the information that flows. And some countries that, uh, with whom we have good relations are beginning to flirt with the kinds of legislation to hold people accountable for fake news and deep fakes and the kinds of individual personal targeting that could influence uh, how you think about people of color or women or uh, some other politically, potentially politically charged issue. Now, flip that same coin over that you just said. I, so I do believe that democracy will remain viable. But just as democracy had to get used to roads and railroads and telegraph and television, etc. Technology caused us to adapt our democracy in important ways, but we still remain a free people. We're going to have to adapt, and I think we can. But we have to have uh, a, a body of policy and a body of legislation that helps us to do that. Flip that coin over, I do believe that artificial intelligence will potentially accelerate illiberalism and the rise of authoritarianism. And in particular, those states that draw their power, not from the consent of the willing, not from the consent of the voting masses, but draw their power from their capacity to control their masses and control their populations, AI has the capacity to provide extraordinary surveillance capabilities. So let's talk about China for a minute, since you, you, you study China. China, if it is not, is potentially going to become the most potent surveillance state on the planet. Um, Kai Fu Li, who wrote the book uh, AI Superpowers, read that book sometime. It'll make your blood run cold. The Chinese capacity through their phone systems, their iPhones, if you will, and their applications to have access to every click of your phone, every message that you send, every financial transaction that you ultimately author, Wherever your car goes, your, your license plate is surveilled. Uh, we know what you eat. 
We know where you go. We know what movies you watch. We know where you're on I, the, uh, the internet. And the Chinese have created something, as, as you well know, many in here know, of something called the social index. And you get a number. And where that number is on a scale uh, ultimately generates your access within society. So people with a high number get a passport. People with a low number, because they are considered uh, unreliable potentially, don't get a passport. Children with a high number, or families with a high number go to colleges. Some don't. Very, I just promoted a young officer to colonel recently who, in his National War College class, visited China with, with a segment of his seminar. And they were on a train from Beijing to Guangzhou. And as the train pulled out of the station, there was a long announcement, which the interpreter then translated to the people that, that basically said to all the passengers on the train, uh, I'll just boil it down, you better behave because if you get in trouble, it's going to affect your social index number. There are companies in China, when you're asked to express yourself on a political issue, you can go to that company and it will give you the answer, which is calibrated to give you a better return on your social index number than before. So I think AI will force us to have to think in different ways about our democracy, but I think our democracy will survive. And I think it'll probably be strengthened by it because of all the good that AI will do to our open society. But here's the challenge. It is how authoritarians can have greater surveillance control of their populations to accelerate the movement of some countries to authoritarianism. Here's the problem. In the developing world, where we are in constant competition with China in the developing world, when the Chinese come rolling in, part of their package for the strong people, strong men, they're always strong men, when they, when they come rolling in and they want to empower the strong men to facilitate Chinese interests, part of the package for development is a surveillance package. And if they come rolling in and they put in a 5G network, you ain't ever going to dig them out of that 5G network. So this is, once again, this is the issue of American leadership versus other leadership in the world today and whether we're willing to compete at a grand strategic level. So AI, it's going to be another playing field where we're going to have to compete. And right now, we are way behind uh, the authoritarians in that process. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for that question. And uh, I, I have to comment, that, sir, you might not have noticed this wave of dissonance that uh, kind of went across the crowd among our cadets when you talked about promoting a young person to colonel. Uh, that kind of threw a couple off balance there. Uh, well, I see a couple commissioned officers <laughs> who are running for the doors. <laughs> So uh, audience, uh, as, uh, as I fully expected, you've lived up your expectation uh, asking those great softball questions <laughs> that you have for our guests. So give yourself a hand for, for doing such Thank a great you. job. <laughs> uh, and sir, I want to thank you for, uh, for being here with us today. Obviously, uh, tremendously insightful. Uh, and just want to give you the opportunity for the last word before we, uh, we adjourn for lunch. Yeah, we, we, uh, we as a great nation and a great people uh, derived from a great idea, uh, we have a lot of challenges in the world. Uh, and governments will come and governments will go. Uh, this week I had occasion to be with a number of folks and we were pretty, given the news and other things, a little bit down. And uh, last night someone sent me a picture from Washington. It was a picture of a fellow by the name of U.S. Grant. And the message was, if you think we got problems now, think about what this general had to go through. Fought a war against a nation that was fighting to keep an enslaved people numbering in the millions. Fought a war to retain the structural integrity of the United States and the values that we stand for. Fought a war where hundreds of thousands of Americans perished in that war. So we got some problems today. We got some challenges today. I think our democracy is strong. You're seeing it playing out before your very eyes right now. Uh, it's worth having the deep view into history sometimes to ensure that we don't become so, as they say, close battle fixated, uh, that we don't understand that we've been through hard times before and we're gonna get through this and we're gonna get through hard times and again, again, but it's because of who we are as a people and what we are as an idea and not where we are on the globe. So thank you.
Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.